I have kind of a long introduction to this, uh, but uh, unless my timing is just completely off, which it very well could be, this shouldn't be that long. Um, you'll notice I don't have a Bible with me today. I have a workbook, <laughs> but uh, it, I promise it comes from the Bible. It's just, it's written in a form here that's less confusing for me, so I can see it as I need to see it. So, all right. Did you know that there is meditation in Christianity? Of course, not Eastern mysticism meditation, naturally, right? I just wanted to make everybody uncomfortable for a second before I said that. In fact, Zen meditation and Christian meditation are the complete opposites of each other. Uh, Zen meditation is about allowing your thoughts move without control. Christian meditation is about controlling your mind and focusing it on something specific. Uh, I'm not going to go too far into comparison because it really doesn't matter. But I want to define my terms before we talk today. So meditation, in simple terms, means to think intently and specifically about a topic to try and understand it better. We are called as Christians to meditate on scriptures daily, like in Romans chapter 12, too, with the, the renewing of your mind daily. Uh, the word for mind there is actually uh, nous, N-O-O-S, which it wouldn't be those letters because it's Greek, but um, most often translated as mind because what this word actually means is the rational part of one's inner self, right? So um, the, the part of you that is you, right? If, if I replace, I was thinking this just this week. It's so weird because a, the, a banjo player that I really, really like was talking about this banjo that he got that is a, a 1940s top tension head banjo. And he immediately said, this part's been replaced, and this part's been replaced, and this part's been replaced. And I just kind of thought to myself, like, at what point is that no longer a 1940s banjo? Because they replace the head regularly, so that's not new. Chances are the hardware has been replaced once or twice. So what on that banjo is actually from the 1940s, right? But humans are very much the same way, right? We have a completely new collection of cells every, what, 21 days or something like that? So we are a brand new body every month. But I, there's never a day that I have to wake up and go, okay, still me, check. Right? Well, that's your mind. Right? Your mind is beyond physical. Right? And uh, that's the word that's used there. And we'll actually use it later just because I thought it was neat. But in other words, meditation for us is something that we are actively thinking about, not just passively understanding. Right? The reason I'm saying this is because I can't call this a preaching. I can't call it a teaching. I can't call it a sermon. Today, I'm going to share with you a meditation. Um, difference between a meditation and those other things is you might not necessarily feel like there's some kind of conclusion with this. And that's okay because I'm thinking about this intently so that I can understand this better. And what I'm doing is I'm inviting you guys this week to think about it too. Right? So you know that uh, when you read the Bible, and God draws you to some verse or other, and he puts a simple question in your mind. He's telling you something, right? I can't say he's trying to tell you something. I'd want to say he's trying to tell you something, but God doesn't try. He succeeds, right? So at that point, the ball is actually in our court. We can either accept this invitation of him and dive deeper into our understanding of who he is, or we can choose to pass on the invite and remain where we are spiritually and in our understanding. Uh, I'm not saying this is to bring guilt on anyone or anything, but there are truly are days where you read up to a full chapter of the Bible and you don't really feel any draw to, to any deeper understanding of it. You just kind of read it 
you know? And that's, that's fine, you know, uh, take your daily medicine, right? But I might add, if at the end of every day, you can't even quote one of the verses that you read, were you really trying to learn something? You know? Um, but the fact remains, some days you just don't feel that nudge from God to learn more. Some days you read something uh, that, that you just read it and you think, well, that's nice. And you walk away. Sometimes you read something that literally shakes the foundation of what you believe God to be. And it just totally flips you on head, right? Um, I remember the first time that that happened to me. Uh, it was actually Romans chapter 3. It was when I learned that the point of the law of Moses was so that we would recognize that we can't be like God. And it's the jumping off point for the fact that our salvation is exclusively his decision. Uh, that was the first step for me, breaking free of a lifetime of religion, right? Following the right rules and saying the right prayers, and he'll be like, okay, I'll let you in. <laughs> no, no, right? Sometimes that happens. But there's, there's also another one. And this, this one I, I find happens to me very often, but I think that it happens to me very often because I'm kind of like this. And so God uses my personality to do it this way. But with this one, um, do, 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 do. oh yeah, 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 okay. You read a verse that completely refreshes your spirit. It's just, it's just like fresh water after a hot meal outside on a hot day, and then you get that ice cold water. Right? And it's just, everything just kind of goes, oh, wow. But in the words of C.S. Lewis, um, you're not prepared to explain why. Your brain is totally out of the loop. Your spirit feels it, but your brain doesn't really get it. Right? Um, kind of a, uh, you know, piece that passes all understanding, right? A fun fact, the word understanding there is actually the s same word, but in a different grammatical tense as the word for mind we used earlier. So your pattern of thinking, it passes it. You've got the piece, you know you've got the piece, but your brain got left behind somewhere because your brain's not quite as connected as the rest of your spirit is, right? Well, Paul actually addresses this in a way. Uh, he said that every time he prayed in tongues, he would also pray in his mind because he wanted both to be fed at the same time, both his spirit and his mind. That's 1 Corinthians 14, 15, if you want to look it up. So let's take his conclusion and use it here. If you read a verse that refreshes your soul, maybe you should also attempt to understand it with your mind. So it's time to meditate on that scripture. That's when it's time. Give God the chance to give you or brain the understanding that your spirit got immediately because your spirit searches the unthinking things of God, right? But your mind doesn't. So it's this situation with a particular verse that I want to share with you today. Today we have um, two verses, but one of them is only supplementary. So as far as meat goes, today we have one verse, just one. You know why? Because that's all God needed to teach me something. Sometimes it's just one verse. Sometimes it's just one word. That verse is going to be Deuteronomy 11.1. 1. Uh, we're going to have it up there in NIV, but I'm actually going to be reading it from the BHS, which is the, uh, the standard edition of the Hebrew Bible. And the only reason I'm doing this, I'm not trying to be pretentious or show offy, and I have to tell myself that because Satan's telling me that that's what I'm doing. But the reason I'm doing it is to keep my thoughts straight uh, on what I'm trying to explain to you guys. Uh, and as I said, um, I'm not doing it to show off because I even had to use my student workbook to, to read it because if I was to see it in its full biblical form, it would just confuse me, right? So 
I'm, I promise I'm not trying to show off. I'm just a student here. But I learned something, and I'd like to share it. So, um, da, 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 da. okay. So first we're going to read this. And I'll read it in Hebrew first, and then we'll see it in English. But um, it says, uh, uh, and uh, this, is, this is completely unnecessary, but I'm going to be using somewhat of a reconstructed original pronunciation, not a modern pronunciation. It l literally does not matter, right? I, I read the English Bible with a bad accent all the time, and God hasn't struck me down yet, right? Um, but, so, Wahavta et Yahweh Eloheika. Ushamarta shimshorto wahuk o tayu u mishpathayu u mitsothayu kol hayomim. Right. So up here we've got love the Lord your God and keep his. I'm just going to say mishmorto for now. His decrees, or uh, I'm going to say statutes. His laws, instead of laws, I'm going to say his judgments and uh, his commandments all day, every day. Basically what we're reading here. So the first thing I'd like to do is actually zoom in right over here on, we have two focuses with this verse. And the first one is going to be this one word. And the second one is actually going to be a grammatical idea. And I do apologize, I'm going to nerd out about grammar, but I really promise you that this time it matters. This isn't me, the high school Spanish teacher, saying, but the grammar's important. This is this one, you'll see when we get there, it matters. It, it really does. So this word that I'm looking at is mishmarto. His, the NIV says requirements. Uh, the NASB says charge. And I'm not saying that these are poorly translated. I'm not saying that there's some dastardly plan of the translators to mislead you in the understanding of the scriptures. I'm not saying that. But I want to zoom in on this word and really learn what it means to them so that we can have a better understanding of what it means to us. So first off, that T-O at the end, the toe at the end, that just means his. Of interest to me, it's actually singular, not plural. Um, in this translation, it's translated plurally. In the NASB, it is translated singularly. Everything that's listed after that is plural. And, and I think we'll see why that's important here later. But, um, but this is actually singular. So it's, it's one thing. It's not a collection of things. It's not a, a generic amalgam of things. It's one specific thing, right? So there's two forms of this word that are in my Hebrew dictionary, uh, and either one of them, uh, normally I would go against the dangers of, of looking at multiple versions of one word, but if you're ever looking at a language like Arabic or Hebrew or something like that, uh, you're pretty safe to do that uh, because of the way their language works. They have root words in everything. So we're just using uh, two different words out of the exact same root. So mishmar means prison. Guard or guarding, custody or watch. And the other version is mishmeret, which means watch, guard, or responsibility. Hmm. So point one is this is not a general thing. This is a specific thing, right? And we'll kind of see as we keep going with this. And I noticed that because it was singular. See, I didn't have the English Bible to, to make me just kind of pass over that at the time. All I had was this, and it's singular. And I realized after this, he's got a couple things here. He's got and his statutes, and his judgments, and his commandments, right? And so it says, you will obey or observe these four things. Well, I know that this isn't one of those things that falls into the scripture generic category because he covered all of the scripture generics right there. His statutes, right? Do this, don't do this, right? Like, uh, like a daily living advice, 
right? His statutes, right? Uh, it, one of the ones is he told the Israelites to not wear clothing made out of more than one fabric, right? That's part of the law. That's one of the statutes, right? Um, then he's got his judgments. Well, God's judgments are if God says that it's wrong, it's wrong. We observe those things, right? If God says that it's right, it's right, right? Observing his judgments. So all of the, all of the uh, what we'd call the moral side of the law, God passes judgment on certain behaviors, right? He says, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. So all of that part of the scripture is covered right there. And then we have mitzvathayu, which is the his, it, it's his and it's plural and it's commandments. So not just the Ten Commandments, but all of the thou shalt nots, right? So all of the generic scope of the entire Torah up to this point, right? The first five books, because the rest of the books haven't been written. We're in Deuteronomy, right? All of the scope of that, what God has said to the Israelites across all five books is encapsulated in those three words, so I know that this first word is something else. It's not the generics. And it was at that point that I realized God is being specific. There is a specific watch, guard, responsibility that has been given to the Israelites a specific one that he gave them directly. So my natural response to that was to go back scripture by scripture and try to find one. Where, where is this charge? Where is this responsibility, this custody that God has given to these Israelites. And I went back and I went back and I went back. And the first thing that I did learn about this, this statement about this, this verse here is that this is a conclusionary statement. Uh, right before this, he's, he's talking about, you have seen how good God is and you know what God has done for you. Therefore, conclusionary statement, love God and keep his requirements, right? So I kept going back, and what I'm looking for is, is maybe a commandment, maybe something written in the imperative, maybe something that's a specific, one might say, well, your watch, your guard, duty, like a job, right? It seems to me that God has given these people a job. So I wanna know what it is. And as I backed up, I found Deuteronomy 10, 11. Go, the Lord said to me. Um, that is written in the imperative tense. But he's talking to Moses here, and we'll look at this. Go, the Lord said to me, and lead the people on their way so that they may enter and possess the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. That's the job. That's the charge. And God being amazing as he always is, overwhelmingly amazing, he's got two jobs here, right? He's got a specific job to one person, and he's got a collective job to his entire people, right? Specific job, Moses, lead the people. Because when you lead the people, they will accomplish their job. See, this is sequential. It's not, it's not a list of things, it's a sequence. You lead them, they will enter and possess. And we all know that that's exactly true because Moses didn't enter or possess. Moses' job was to lead them, it was never to enter or possess. So there's a specific job that Moses has and there's a specific job that the Israelites have. You will enter and possess this land. So all of a sudden I was able to reread 11.1. One. Love the Lord your God and, sequential, you will do what he asked you to do. 
You will do the job that he's given you. And you will follow his statutes. And you will follow his judgments. In other words, you will observe his judgments. The way God sees things, you'll see things too. Right? And you will follow. They only use the verb once, but we'll deal with that later. And you will follow his commandments every day. The way they say that in Hebrew is all the days, which is actually the same way it'd be said in Spanish. So we found the charge. So now the question becomes, how do I apply this to me? Well, there were a couple things about this. And the first one is actually what, I, what really hit me about this verse that I didn't really understand at first. You know, uh, we, we always talk about obeying God and, you know, it's important to, to do this, don't do this, button your shirt up nicely, wear your good clothes on. So, wait a second. No, I think we came up with that one. Right? No, I'm kidding. But, but you know what I'm saying? We, we have this sort of generic collective that we're like, well, as long as I do these things, I'm, I'm good to go. Right? It was impressive to me that our individual job that God gave us to do is put in collective with everything else. Like I said, I can't necessarily provide you with some conclusionary statement about how that applies, but isn't that fascinating? The, the things that we consider being good Christians in doing, our job is a part of that list. It is included. How many Christians do you guys know in life that say, I don't think I have a job for the kingdom of God? You've heard it. I feel like I don't have a job. I feel like God never uses me on anything. You have a job. You have a job. The job that was given to you is listed with every other good Christian behavior. Now, we'll talk about good Christian behavior in another message because, you know, we, we fail at that, by the way. I want to remind you. But I think that this will help you with that understanding, too, because God is very consistent with his recognition of our behavior. Um, you have a job. It's a part of it. It is in a collective with all of the other things that God put in, the, in this, these books. Every commandment, right? We, we spout off the Ten Commandments. Your job is a part of that collective. You have a job. If you don't know what it is, don't feel bad about it. Ask God what it is, right? You have a singular individual job, right? God said, Jonathan, lead the people. Shane, Make sure they can hear him. Larry, make sure they come back. He puts tracking devices on all your vehicles. Right? Right? Levi, preach when he's gone. Right? You have a specific job. But we also have a collective job. Enter the land and possess it for God. It's, it's not possessing it for yourself, right? It's, it's your guard duty of what is his, right? It's his custody. He wants you to watch it. I don't have to extend this very far. Where's our land that we need to possess? Yeah. Right outside that door. It's right there. We have a collective job. And it's right out there. These people are hurting. And we know it because we've seen it. We're, we're hearing about horrible things going on outside these doors. That's our land to possess. That's our charge. You have a charge as a church and you have one as an individual. Your individual job, that may just be here in these doors. It may not really go out there necessarily, right? But our collective job, we 
God's chosen people of uh, NBLC, and we're not chosen because we earned it. I just want to point that out, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> he didn't choose you because he thought you were great. He chose you because he wanted to, <laughs> right? But that's our charge. That's our job. We have one. So that was the first thing that I, I got out of this. And I hope that you guys agree that I'm not making any crazy extensions of the, the scripture here. I feel like that's all pretty, pretty specific. It's, it's pretty much right there. Um, now, here's where we get to the part that I actually noticed because I was reading another verse. And I, I heard, uh, I was reading something from a, a very religious-based person. It was, it was all about following the rules, you know. And he made this conclusion, well, that's easy enough to understand, but how do you do it? How do I do it? I am one me. Um, we are one we, right? How are we supposed to get to them? Most of us don't even walk down the streets where the people that are hurting are. And it's not because we're trying to avoid them. It's because that's not on the road. You know? How do we do that? I have the answer here, and this is point number two. Grammar. I do love grammar, so I will enjoy this. And I have a captive audience, so I will enjoy that. But, no, I'm kidding. Um, no, but seriously, I do love grammar. Grammar makes me happy. I think it's exciting. It's why I learn languages. First off, there's, there's two things that we're looking at here in Hebrew. So in English, we have a past tense, a present tense, a future tense, right? We talk about the, the past, the present, or the future. We care about time, right, when we, when we use words. Hebrew does not have that at all. They don't have an, I did that yesterday, I do it today, I will do it tomorrow, I am doing it now. They don't have it. It doesn't exist. The only thing they have, two verb tenses, and that's it. We have, by the way, like eight, but they only have two. You've either finished doing it, or you haven't finished doing it. That's it. Imperfect, perfect. If it was an action that was done and completed the end, whether it's in the past, the present, or the future, it's perfect tense. If you have an action that you haven't completed yet, but will, or if it's something that you do continually, you don't have any intention of ever completing it because you do it every day, right? Like breathing, for a, like a violently obvious example, right? Whether it be in the past, or the present, or the future, if you haven't finished it yet, or it's a continual action, it's imperfect. You know that, that verse, uh, and I love this, um, I am that I am, that's who I say you are, that's in the imperfect tense. Because it doesn't start, and it doesn't stop. It is the continual existence of God. No beginning, no end, there can't be. So he says, I am twice in the imperfect tense because there's no start stop that way, there's no start stop that way, there's no start stop that way, which is like the eighth dimension, we don't even have that, right? But God does. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I nerded out a little bit there. But, but really, like, like, he is absolutely existing. That's the best way to say that. He is existing. That's it. No start, no stop. That's it. That's, that's God, right? So let's look at the verb tense here. What tense are these verbs being used in? And by the way, um, there's only two of them. There's only two verbs in this sentence, right? There's wachavta and washamarta, and that's it. Um, because of that little wa sound at the beginning, these are actually written in the perfect tense. I, I promise I'm not making this up, grammar's weird. But they are to be translated imperfectly. They do that for grammatical reasons to avoid confusion of if I was actually making a list or if I'm creating a cause and effect sequence. That's why they do that. But this is translated imperfectly. What that means is he's not saying Love me and obey my commandments. That's command form. He's not doing that. This isn't command form. 
It's not written that way. If you read these verses all across Deuteronomy and you hear God saying, do it now, he's not. He would have said it in the imperative if he was. He's not saying that. So that's the first interesting thing. This is not a command to you. It's a statement. Love God. What, like on Sunday and then we get to stop? No, that would be perfect tense, right? If you only did it one day? No, continually. Continually. But it's not a command because God's not making you do it. That's your choice, right? That's one of the reasons the Old Testament talks about all the amazing things God's have, God has done so often because it's saying, look what he did for you. Love him. See, because it's not something that they want to make. It's not a commandment. It's a reality for your life. The second thing is this, these was that I told you about. This is called the wow consecutive. What that means is this is not a list of things. Now, there actually is a list of things here, but it's not verbs. It's nouns, right? His charge, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments. See, that's a list of things, right? But the verbs are not written as a list of things. The verbs are written in the consecutive sequential order. What on earth does that mean? That means you first do the one thing and then the other thing comes out of it. So the question of the day, who's on first? <laughs> I like jokes. Who's on first? What, what comes first in that verb? Who's on first? What do you think? Anybody got that verse out? You want to show it to him? Give us 11.1 again. Who's on first? Oh, love the Lord your God. He's on first. Like I said, this is a sequence. Love God and then keep his commandments will occur. It's a sequence of events. It's not a list of events, right? Who's on first? Love God first. Please stop torturing yourself and your family and your friends by trying to follow his decrees, laws, commands, and requirements first. You can't do it. Neither can I. No one can. We hurt ourselves so much as people because we try to do the second one first. You can't. And the way it's written in Hebrew says this is a sequence. Love God. And then this part will happen. It's not wake up in the morning, feeling like P. Diddy, <clears throat> and then do this requirement, and then do this requirement, and then do this requirement. No, wake up in the morning loving God and all of those four things will just kind of happen throughout your day. It's a sequence, a consecutive sequence of events. First this happens, and then this just kind of comes along. This happens too. See? There's only two verbs in this whole sentence. Love God and you will obey. Because he's going to take care of that part. God takes care of that part. That's why we got the Holy Spirit. That's why we were given the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus Christ died as a sacrifice for us. Because God always intended on taking care of the second part. All he wants you to do is put him on first base or home if you want him really close. 
we could do that baseball analogy all day. Right? For real. Right? All he wants to do is be first. The rest of it he takes care of as a natural extension of your decision to love him. So here's the question. How do I do this job? How do we do that job? Love God every morning. And all of a sudden, you'll look back on your day at night, and you'll realize you already did it. <laughs> How's that for wine? It's good wine, right? Yeah. Love God. And the job will happen. So if you're worried about what your job is, as much as, by the way, like I used to, you're worried about obeying his statutes, judgments, and, and commandments. Stop worrying about that part. You know, Jonathan just last week was talking about divine appointments, and he decided to explain what they were, right? Love God first, and he'll bring the job to you. And you'll love the job. You will love the job. Yep. Yep. The, the, the person that needs you will get lost on the highway and stop in front of the gas station to ask you for directions. God will bring the job to you. Stop stressing about that. Stop stressing about whether you followed all of his commands today and just love him. And when you do, he'll take care of the rest. Amen? Amen. I love it. That's it for me. Thank you guys for listening.